So yeah, text. Our applications use text, um, but a lot of us use Unicode. I certainly didn't understand what was going on um, properly until like relatively recently in my career. So I thought it might be interesting to cover a few things. So we do have a little bit of content to cover today. Um, I want to run through some text encoding basics, quickly cover the history of Unicode and how it developed, how it actually works under the hood. Um, we'll go into a rabbit hole and find some of the more interesting corners of some of the Unicode and sort of text that we manage in our systems. Then we'll bring it back home with uh, what this means for us in terms of Unicode aware development within our apps as app developers um, and round it out with a few things that we've learned. So encoding basics. This is ASCII. Hopefully everybody knows ASCII. Um, we know that we represent characters in computer systems using numbers. Um, ASCII was a seven bit encoding, which means there's 128 possibilities, zero to 127. And in ASCII, hex for one is Latin capital A. But that doesn't work. Uh, it was great for like teletype terminals in you know, the 70s, but it doesn't work for you know, European languages with accents in. So then we developed a bunch of different standards around text encoding. Um, this is ISO IEC 8859-1, which is a bit of a mouthful, so a lot of people know it as ISO Latin 1, uh, which is an 8-bit encoding, so 256 possible values. And this is common with ASCII for 0 to 127, but then we have a bunch of other characters uh, which include you know, accented characters so that we can speak French and you know, German and things like that. And in this encoding scheme, C1 is Latin capital A with an acute accent. But of course, this doesn't cover all of the text that we have in the world. So if we were uh, you know, using a Mac in the late 80s, early 90s in Thailand, we might have been using this Macintosh Thai encoding, um, which again, similarly is you know, 0 to 127 is common with ASCII and ISO Latin 1, but we've got different characters um, in 128 to 255. So in this case, C1 is not like capital A acute, it's Thai character Mo Ma. So this means that before we had Unicode, we had to know it's encoding in order to be able to decode text and reason about like the actual characters this string of numbers in memory was gonna represent, right? And this was sometimes called uh, code pages. Different encodings were assigned to code pages, a term mostly used in Windows. Um, and you'd have to sort of communicate this out of band from your text content. So you'd have you know, your text encoding and a content type header on your HTTP request response um, or in the meta tags of an HTML page or something like that. But what about scripts with thousands of characters, right? We know Chinese, Japanese, you know, they have more than 256 characters. So we ended up developing a bunch of two byte encodings for characters, right? So we had more options and some encodings started using you know, multiple bytes to represent uh, a single character or one byte, sometimes a bit smaller. Um, and it started, things were starting to get you know, a bit complicated. Which brings us to Unicode. So this is a quote from the original paper describing Unicode in 1988 by a guy called Joe Becker. And he said, Unicode is intended to address the need for a workable, reliable world text encoding. Unicode could be roughly described as wide body ASCII that has been stretched to 16 bits to encompass the characters of all the world's living languages. In a properly engineered design, 16 bits per character are more than sufficient for this purpose. So Unicode 1.0 came out in 1991. And then that included support for 24 scripts, including you know, Latin, Thai, Arabic, Hebrew, Cyrillic, like a lot of languages, apart from those sort of East Asian ones, um, which came in 1992 in the second volume, covering what are known as the Han ideographs. And any Unicode 1.0 character could be represented in two bytes, which was known as the UCS2 encoding. And as a result of this, like a lot of systems adopted two byte character types for strings. So WHRT and C90 and C++ um, is two bytes wide on Windows where it became the underpinning of like the Windows UI text system. Unichar and NS string on next step was also two bytes wide. And the Java char type um, is also two bytes wide. And this is all because of you know, a common uh, understanding that character types should probably be two white bytes wide so that we can you know, support Unicode. Talking a little bit about East Asian scripts, which are kind of interesting. So in Chinese, we have the Hanji, uh, Japanese Kanji and Korean Hanja, which are all logographic scripts. Um, so unlike our alphabetic language, 
this means that there's sort of a picture which represents a, a word in the spoken language. And these are all sort of derived from the writing system that was in use in ancient China during the Han Dynasty, like thousands of years ago. And then it sort of got adopted. Uh, and although the spoken languages like changed uh, significantly, the writing system had a lot of commonality. And so in Unicode 1.0, we had 20,940 characters assigned to what are known as the CJK ideographs, which is for Chinese, Japanese, and Korean, which was 32% of the sort of available characters in Unicode, right? Because we have two bytes, we have 65,000 odd characters, so it's 30% just for these ones. And this was only possible because of the uh, Unicode Han unification effort, um, which basically said, well, although these characters um, might be slightly different today in Chinese, Japanese, and Korean, if we identify a common Han ideograph root, where ideograph means a picture representing a concept rather than a sort of a word which is more correlated with a spoken language, um, we can sort of use that same representation for what's different words across these languages. And in some cases, they're written slightly differently today. So this saved a lot of space, right? So we didn't have to have duplicate characters in Unicode for these different languages. But it was a little bit controversial because it means that there are some cases where uh, the same Han ideograph might be written differently between like Chinese and Japanese, and people were worried they would lose their cultural differences. And it does mean that today, like some of this East Asian script uh, text will render differently depending on your font choice, even if it's the same Unicode characters. So despite like this massive effort to try and figure out how to compress uh, East Asian scripts, Unicode still ran out of space. So in Unicode 2.0, the Unicode Consortium uh, moved and expanded Hangul. Hangul is the sort of modern Korean writing system, um, which is actually kind of fascinating. It's a sort of a mixture between an alphabet and um, a sort of syllabic writing system where the letters, which are known as Jamo, are sort of representing, they're sort of drawn um, in a way that represents the shape your tongue makes when making the sound. And then these like Jamo are comprised into larger blocks. So you have like a large block character, which might look similar to like a uh, Han type pictograph, but actually is like, comes to be built from a completely different uh, mechanism. So in Unicode 2.0, uh, they added 11,000 syllables as new characters just to fix Hangul, which they got wrong in Unicode 1.0, where they had like a bunch of other symbols allocated for it. So, you know, 30,000 for CJK, a new 11,000 for um, Hangul, and you can kind of see where this is going. So they also have the foresight to introduce a new way of encoding a larger number of characters, that 65,000, using a mechanism called surrogates, which we'll come back to. And Unicode 3.1 in 2001 was the first time that we actually had characters in the Unicode standard that were outside of the range that you could address using the original two-byte uh, UCS2 encoding. And because we'd broken through this kind of glass ceiling of 65,000 characters, the Unicode uh, standards body thought they could be you know, more ambitious. And they decided they wanted to expand their remit and cover all characters of all the writing systems of the world, modern and ancient. And this is kind of important um, when it comes to uh, sort of East Asian scripts. So now there's 150 scripts in Unicode, more than those 20 odd we had in the first version. And we've got you know, close to 88,000 CJK ideographs, um, a lot of them from ancient Chinese texts. And that's more characters just for CJK languages than we had possible to represent in Unicode 1.0. That's correct as of uh, Unicode 12.1, which is the latest. And of course, over the past decade, the world has developed an insatiable appetite for emoji, and we have to put them somewhere. So that's kind of like what happened about Unicode and how it came to be. Now, how does Unicode actually work? Um, it's an interesting question. So some basics of modern Unicode. So Unicode defines a 21-bit code space of 0 to 10 FFFF, which is about 1.1 million values. So each individual value in this range is known as a code point. And code points are often written as a sort of hex value preceded by U+. Plus. So in this case, U plus 0041 is our Latin capital letter A. 41, you might remember, is the same number that it had in ASCII. That's deliberate. And the original range of 0 to FFFF is now kind of commonly referred to as the basic multilingual plane. 
And if we look at the entire Unicode code space as it stands today, there's more than one uh, plane. There's uh, 17 of them. And uh, if you were to map it out, this is what it looks like um, with blue as, um, so each small box is a 16 by 16 block of characters. And then we have 16 by 16 blocks of 16 by 16 to make up a plane, which is the larger squares. Um, and this is like the entire 1.1 million uh, uh, values possible in Unicode. So in the top left, we have our basic multilingual plane, which is where we had all of the characters in Unicode 1.0, which has been added to still. It's quite busy. Um, and then we have plane one, which is the supplementary multilingual plane, which is where the emoji live. And plane two, which is the supplementary ideographic plane, uh, which is where like, all those extra CJK ideographs were added. And a lot of the rest of it is unallocated currently, so plenty of space for future expansion. Um, and then we have these things called private use areas, which are mapped out. There's a little bit in the basic multilingual plane, and there's two whole planes like much higher in the code space. Um, and this is where sort of the standards body says, we're not going to define what these code points actually mean. You can use them for something that's meaningful to you within your own applications. But if you ever try to interchange that with somebody else's system, they might not agree on the meaning. An interesting example of this is um, Apple started using uh, a character in the PUA in the BMP uh, for their own logo because they always used to be able to have the Apple logo in, I think, the Chicago font in the original Mac. Um, and so if you have this Apple logo character in some text and you copy and paste it, it'll work and render fine on iOS and Mac OS, but if you move it to Windows or Linux, um, it might not render correctly. And that's because it's a private use area character. It was not an official uh, character in the Unicode standard. And there's also this red area blocked out in the BMP for surrogates, which is that term that keeps on cropping up. So we'll come on to that in a second. So representing code points as bytes, right? So now we have characters greater than hex 10,000. How do we represent them? Because we can't fit them into a two byte quantity. And what we need to do is define an encoding scheme to represent our sort of now abstract Unicode code points uh, and figure out how to translate that into a sequence of bytes that we can actually you know, put into files or send to other computers over the network. And there's many sort of encoding schemes that are possible, sort of an infinite number of coding schemes are possible. Uh, but the most common are UTF-16 and UTF-8, which you've probably uh, heard of. And this introduces a new concept. Um, so we use encodings to define how we represent a code point as one or more code units. So terminology-wise, a code point is sort of this top-level concept in Unicode, and that's represented by one or more code units, which, according to your encoding scheme, um, may be represented by one or more bytes. So moving on to UTF-16, as we've already seen, we reserve this special range, uh, which is D800 to DFFF, as surrogates. And what this means, surrogates here means sort of a stand-in. So these are code points that are going to sort of stand in for um, a higher valued code point that we wouldn't be able to uh, otherwise represent within our coding system. And we do that by taking a pair of two of them. And so what this means is we take our code point range, we divide it into a high range and a low range. Uh, they have two different prefixes. So the high range has got prefix 110110, and the low has a prefix 110111. And then we can sort of take the, the low bits of our high surrogate and the low bits of our low surrogate, run them together as one long binary number, add hex 10,000. And using this, we can sort of use a pair of two numbers um, to represent one larger number. It's kind of like having a stack of, uh, you know, two stacks of cards from zero to nine. Um, and I pick one card from uh, column A and one card from column B and I hold them up and I can use that to represent, you know, zero to 99. Might be easiest to understand this by working through an example. So if we have a grinning face emoji, which as we know, is outside of the basic multilingual plane, so it's uh, got code point 1F600. In binary, that's this. So if you look at the groups, like it's 1F600. And if we take away 10,000 from it, we have an exciting animation. So that becomes zero. And these are just the numbers. We cut it in half, 
right? And we take the top bits and we use that to uh, put in the bottom of our high pair with the high pair prefix of 110110 and we give us the hex value D83D. And then we take the red from our low pair and put it at the end of our low pair prefix of 11011 and we get DE00. And what that means is that in UTF-16, our grinning face emoji is in fact D83D DE00. Unicode demystified. So that's UTF-16. Um, UTF-8 is also a common encoding and it's variable width like UTF-16, uh, but it has a code unit size of one byte. And each code point can then be encoded as like one to four code units, depending on which character we have. And so if we have a low value code point between 0 and 7f, which is 0 to 127, same as the range in ASCII, then we can just take our seven bits that we use for the code point, put a zero on the front, and then we're done, which is actually really handy. Um, if it's a bit bigger, if it's between 8, 0, and 7ff, then we have to say, well, we don't have space in one byte. So on the first byte, we put this prefix of 110. There's two ones, which means two bytes total for this code point. And then on the um, second byte, we put this 10 prefix, which means this is a follow-on uh, code unit for a code point, which started before you got here. And similarly, if it's in a bigger range, we have 1110 for three bytes total, 10 prefixes on the following two bytes. And then for anything outside of the basic multilingual plane, um, we have 11110 for four bytes total, and then 10 prefixes on the rest. And then we take the binary uh, digits from our code point number and we just distribute them amongst our sort of follow-on bytes, um, our, our first and follow-on bytes, uh, to encode our total code point number. So working through our example again, if we have a grinning face emoji, 1F600 still, this is the binary. Uh, so then if we put our prefix and then three follow-on bytes with the 10 uh, prefixes on them, then if we div like divide up the bits in our code point number and if we just spread them throughout like the code units in, in the sequence, then that's how we encode our UTF-8 sequence. So in UTF-8, grinning face emoji is F09F9880. Cool. So that's how encodings work. Um, UTF-8 has become more popular than UTF-16 uh, over the years, and that's partly because it's backwards compatible with ASCII, right? So if we saw it's between 0 and 127, we just stick a 0 on the front, and then that means that uh, if we have any, it's exactly the same uh, representation that we have uh, if we have ASCII text. So if we have any ASCII, we can read that, and it's valid UTF-8, which is a cool property to have. Um, also, I guess if you think about it uh, in UTF-16, if you don't use any of the bits in your sort of high high pair, then you'll have a lot of nulls in your in your byte stream. Um, or sorry, if you don't use the high bits of like a single code unit, um, then you'll have a lot of zeros. And a lot of systems were developed using C strings, where we have a sequence of bytes uh, with zero as a null terminator. And so if we start trying to use UTF-16 in uh, C strings, then we'll immediately hit zeros in our string and, and we won't be able to reason about how long the, the string is using kind of the C string storage system. So that means that people have to have different storage systems for UTF-16, so it's not necessarily backwards compatible. So if you've got like database APIs that just take a byte buffer, maybe it, it, life starts to get a bit complicated. Um, so the fact that UTF-8 is backward compatible with C strings because you never have any zeros in the middle um, means it, it sort of has started to take over a bit. Um, it's also denser than UTF-16 for Western text because if all you have is ASCII, then every other uh, byte is going to be zeros. Um, and by Western scripts, I mean text which has a high incidence of characters from the Latin alphabet. Um, so if you have uh, entirely sort of you know Japanese text, then probably you know UTF-16 is is perhaps on average um, more efficient than UTF-8. But no matter what you do, if you then compress it, like it starts to come out in the wash anyway. 
UTF-16, because we're talking about two byte-sized integers, um, is n independent, so you have to think about byte swapping, particularly if you're interfacing with other systems uh, by file transfer or over the network, and UTF-8 isn't, so that's cool. And neither are fixed width, so I think, you know, after we decided we needed more space in Unicode, a lot of people try to continue to treat the world as though it was still UCS2 and we could just say, well, you know, to get the 10th character, we just go, you know, 10 times 2 into our array and, and it's fine, right? Um, and, it, you know, it, it sort of degrades somewhat gracefully. Um, you might end up slicing characters in the middle, but generally it all works. But if you really want to handle it correctly, you already have to deal with the complexity of a, of a variable width encoding. Um, so if you're going to do that, then why not just go with UTF-8? And we also have UTF-32. Uh, where each code unit is four bytes, um, but this is generally kind of like wasteful and not super widely used, although it does crop up in some systems, as we'll see. Um, and this means like if you have ASCII, then you're only using one of your four bytes, right? So for every character in your string, you're wasting, you know, 75% of your memory. So, recapping, if we use our grinning face emoji as an example, we have in UTF-32 one code point, which is represented using a single code unit, which is represented using four bytes. In UTF-16, we have one code point, which is represented using two code units, each of which is two bytes. And in UTF-8, uh, we have one code point, which is represented using four code units, each of which is one byte. So no matter which encoding you're using, this is going to be four bytes uh, size, but the bytes will be different. Cool. So um, now we understand a bit more about Unicode. Let's see where things get interesting. Um, so what is a character starts to become a question that we need an answer to. Uh, so Unicode has a number of combining characters which modify other characters in the sequence. So this shows up in our Latin scripts as a diacritic, such as acute, umlaut, grav. Um, and so if we have, you know, 41, which is Latin capital letter A, and then we follow that with 301, which is combining acute accent, that means like combining acute accent is applied to the character preceding it, and those two together become capital A acute. So these combining diacritics uh, can often be applied to multiple letters in the alphabet, right? So if we had an E and we applied an acute to it, then we'd get E acute. And multiple diacritics can apply to a single letter, and this sort of avoids having separate code points for every possible combination that we have in all diacritical marks across all characters having to be allocated their own unique code points. And so we have to introduce a new concept, right? So a group of code points that appears to the end user as a single character is known as a grapheme cluster. And grapheme is like a term from linguistics, which means the sort of smallest unit of a writing system. And while we're on terminology, Unicode scalar is another term you might have heard, and that just means um, it's a code point excluding the surrogates range, because the surrogates range never really represents real characters. So you should never see anything from the surrogates range as a Unicode scalar. And then that poses an interesting question, because if you've been paying attention, you'll see that A acute can be 41301 as capital A plus combining acute, or it can be C1 as Latin capital A with acute on its own as its own Unicode code point uh, using the C1 value, which also might seem familiar. And often these were sort of inherited from other encodings, like in this case ISO Latin 1, where C1 is also capital A acute, or, you know, back in the day when computers were smaller, it was optimizations because these kinds of characters cropped up regularly or they were particularly important or something like that. Um, it's also important to know that if you have multiple diacritics, they could be specified in any order. So in order to deal with this complexity, the Unicode standard has um, a bunch of rules for a process called normalization which basically says there is a order in which you need to compare things and there's a way in which you resolve like these ambiguities um, and there's algorithms for doing that and data sets for doing that um, so that you can uh, reason about the fact that these two characters um, are really the same. So that means we've added the, kind of this new concept on top, right? So we have this grapheme cluster, or there's also this extended grapheme cluster, the differences aren't really very important, um, which is comprised of one or more code points, also known as Unicode scalars, um, which are themselves comprised of one or more code units, which are then one or more bytes, depending on what encoding you have. And we start to sort of think, well, oh, this is a bit of complexity here. You should be careful about what you assume. So some interesting things that crop up in tech systems around the world. 
In German, the SZ character should sort the same as lowercase double s in English, um, but if you were to capitalize that string, we expect to replace that lowercase SZ with the string of two capital S's, like Latin S's, right? So that means if you take your string and you capitalize it, you get a string which is a different length to the one you started with, which might be surprising. And that's true for now, but there is also this grosser s set like character, which exists in German and was in use in some parts of Germany at some points in history. And maybe at some point in the future, we'll decide that lowercase s set should capitalize to uppercase s set, and then we'll have to change our software. Um, but today, uh, that's the state of affairs. Also, interestingly, in Turkish, um, lowercase i without dot capitalizes to uppercase i without dot, and lowercase i with dot capitalizes to capital I uh, with dot, and vice versa. So these are characters which we don't have in English, um, and this has the interesting side effect that in Java, if you take capital I and do dot two lowercase on it, uh, by default, if that's all you do, it will behave differently at runtime depending on what your language is on your end user's system. Um, and this did in fact cause a production issue in our Android app at some point in history. Also in Encyclopedia Britannica, AE is semantically the same as just AE written separately. Uh, but in Icelandic, this is actually a distinct letter which sorts towards the end of the alphabet. So our alphabet ends X, Y, Z. Their alphabet ends X, Y, Y, acute, thorn, ash, a umlaut. Uh, who would have thought about it? So, you know, where do we put that in our sorted list? And you may have come across this. This is a uh, uh, text where we add just ridiculous numbers of diacritical combining characters um, uh, for the lulls. Um, it's known as Zalgo text, and you may see it in memes generated by internet people. Let's talk about like, how we actually render text now. Um, so when we render text, we use fonts. The smallest unit of render is a glyph. And many scripts have ligatures. And what ligatures are, it's where you have two or more distinct characters that are rendered together as a single combined glyph. So this is an example you might see in English where typographers have gone, well, you know, if you've got an F next to an I, wouldn't it look nicer and more beautiful if we create like a special, uh, you know, graphical form of this where the I dot kind of collapses into the lip of the F and oh, our text is wonderful and people want to read it. Um, this then causes interesting problems because if you're trying to design like a text editing system, then you now need to be able to have people position the insertion point inside the smallest unit that you're rendering in. So I guess text rendering is a complicated domain of its own. Uh, also, if your font doesn't have a glyph for a character, uh, you get, might see this square box, um, which is, I think, known in Unicode as the Unicode replacement character. In the land of fonts, it's called the dot not def. Um, but designers didn't like those names, and they thought they wanted to get cutesy, and so the little square, they called it tofu. Um, and there's actually like an interesting talk by, or blog post by Google about how they created a font called uh, Noto for no tofu, where they wanted to create like a combined font that had all characters they could possibly want to uh, render on their systems um, to stop their users from seeing like boxes and not being able to see the text that they wanted just because of the font that was chosen by the developer. I'm sorry to say that things get even more complicated. Um, so Arabic and Brahmic or Indic scripts have many ligatures. So this is an example of uh, U plus FDFA, which is the Arabic ligature Salalahu Alayhi Wasalam, uh, which is an honorific that you'd use, uh, you'd say it after referring to an Islamic prophet. Um, and this is so important that it gets its own Unicode code point, so U plus FDFA, or if you write it out in like a more uh, long form, uh, which is exactly the same meaning, um, it's this long like string, which then decomposes to uni 18 Unicode scalars. So it's either one or 18, same meaning. Um, if you have a simpler example of just these two Arabic characters uh, reading right to left because it's Arabic, so 628 followed by uh, 645, you can see the rendering engine will kind of draw you a single glyph where they nicely uh, flow into each other. And so generally we don't need to worry about text rendering, uh, but sometimes uh, uh, it starts to bleed into our application concerns. Um, and so there is this thing which you might encounter, although it's not super uh, common, called the invisible zero width non-joining character, which is Unicode character 200C, which indicates to the display engine, hey, these two characters, if you would otherwise like draw them as a ligature combined together, just don't because I don't want you to. Uh, so if we have these two Arabic characters, stick a 200C in the middle, then they get rendered separately. And there's a corresponding zero width joiner 200D, which does the opposite. 
So this brings us on to the interesting question of how long is a piece of string? So how many characters is this emoji, which is it's a bit smaller on the screen, but it's um, the Unicode couple with heart, woman, comma, woman. Um, and that's actually a trick question because it depends on what we mean by character and how we're counting. Uh, so it's also interesting to note that if you don't have a glyph for this particular emoji, you might see it rendered as three emojis in sequence. So a woman followed by a heart followed by a woman. Um, and so how long is it? So we can consider that in the writing system emoji, this is like a smallest indivisible unit. Um, so we can say it's one emoji uh, or one extended, extended grapheme cluster. Um, and then the question is, well, how many Unicode scalars is this? So you might guess five because there's three emoji. And then if you say, oh, well, maybe there's zero width joiners in place, then that's, but actually it's uh, six. Um, and the reason is that we have a woman followed by a zero width joiner followed by heavy black heart, which is from the Dingbats range from Unicode 1.0, where it was used, I guess, for playing cards, followed by variant selector 16, which means I'll oh, use this, um, this heart isn't like a rubbish Unicode, uh, a rubbish monochrome heart, it's actually a fully colored emoji heart. And then we've got our zero width joiner and woman, which then means we have eight UTF-16 code units or 16 bytes because our woman emojis are two uh, UTF-16 code units each. And that's also 20 UTF-8 code units or 20 bytes. So depends. Why am I telling you all this? Um, I guess because you know, we are developing apps and our apps are using text and, and it's kind of important to understand uh, what our programming language is doing. So I know we're all um, like Mac OS and iOS developers primarily. Uh, in the room, but I thought it'd be interesting to look at like how languages implement support for text. So in Java, we have this Java Lang string class. Internally, it stores it at UTF-16, which means if we ask Java how long a string is, it will give us a count of UTF-16 code units. And so our couple from before is eight. JavaScript is the same. Python is kind of different. So in like Python before 3.3, it was a bit weird um, and actually, the person building your Python interpreter had to choose whether they wanted a narrow or a wide build. And if it was a narrow build, it would use UTF-16 uh, for code units, uh, for internal storage of strings, of uh, Unicode strings. And if it was a wide build, it would use UTF-32, which then means that if you ask Python how long your string is, depending on whether it was a wide or narrow build, i.e. the choice the person compiling the interpreter you're using, you'd get a different answer and it'd be either eight or six. They fixed this in Python 3.3 and changed it so that it was content dependent. Um, and so that means that depending on what's in your string, if all the characters can be represented as a single byte encoding, it will be. If they can all be represented as a two byte encoding, it will be. And if um, they are not, then it will fall back and use UTF-32, which does mean that if you have emojis in the middle of your string, you might be wasting a bunch of memory in Python. But it does mean that the count will always be the count of Unicode scalars, uh, which in this case is six. Objective-C, as I mentioned like way back in the beginning, uh, dates from the era of two-byte encoding, so it uses UTF-16 for its internal storage. And so if you ask for the length of uh, this emoji, um, it will tell you eight UTF-16 code units. And Swift is kind of uh, a bit more modern from an era where we actually care about Unicode. And um, so they actually changed the implementation of string in 5.0 as part of the ABI stability efforts and they have this new system of UTF-8, but they also drop these breadcrumbs, which is sort of some additional metadata into your string structure, which helps it to uh, reason about like how wide and narrow like different characters are and where in your string um, like any particular byte position is so that it can more easily jump into uh, things later in the end without having to go through it character by character uh, to figure out like how wide they are. And so that means that Swift actually also gives you a count in terms of extended grapheme clusters. Um, and so the length of this emoji is one in Swift, which is cool. So Swift gives us a bunch of options. Uh, and so we can actually ask it all of these things if we know what we're talking about and the difference between these concepts. So we can ask it for the count. Uh, we can ask it for a Unicode scalars uh, view and ask that for the count and it'll give us six. We can ask for UTF-16 view and ask the count, it'll give us eight. UTF-8 and 20. But 
Obviously, if you do use NS string uh, in interoperability with any Objective C code, or if you're still writing Objective C, if you ask for the length, it will give you eight. Those are some nice defaults, right? So as we learned, uh, A acute could be C1 or 41 followed by 301. And in Swift, if we say, are these two strings equivalent? It will say, yep, sure. Um, but NS string doesn't have this smarts by default. So if you ask NS string if these two objects are equal, um, it will say, no, these are different sequences of UTF-16 code units. So that's not the same thing. There are still some cases where it's useful to think about these things though, right? Um, so if we have uh, an array of four strings, um, E, A, E acute, Z, and then we ask for them to be sorted, by default we'll get A, E, Z, E acute, which might not be what we expect. So we can use this localized standard compare op uh, method um, to com uh, compare and do our sort in a locale aware um, manner. And in that case, we'll get A, E, E acute, Z, which matches what we'd see if we had these files in the finder. So, cool, that was quite a lot of stuff. Um, I guess the takeaways are, human writing systems are complex because humans are complex, right? And we're trying to understand how people around the world in different cultures have developed their own languages and writing systems and then be able to deal with all of that complexity in our computer systems so that anybody can use uh, our software and get like an appropriate experience for their cultural and uh, context. But you should be aware of your programming environment's features because by standing on the work, the shoulders of the people who've done a lot of work before us, we actually don't have to interact directly with a lot of this complexity. Um, and as we've seen, Swift has great first party Unicode support. So actually Swift under the hood uses the ICU library, which is an open source library um, available in C and C++ or Java variants. The Java variant actually ships as part of the Android API, um, but the Java string APIs don't use it by default. Um, and of course, Objective-C or Well Foundation behaves differently to Swift, which is important to remember. And we should be careful when we're truncating, capitalizing, and sorting our strings, um, because we need to think about whether we should be respecting the user's locale. And so, as we saw, Swift, you sort of have to say, make that choice. Java might do it by default, and that might also be not what you're expecting. And I say we should use UTF-8 everywhere as an interchange format. So I did consult like a fair number of sources when I was putting together this talk originally internally a few months ago. Um, and I think they're all quite interesting. Um, there's this blog post by Joel Spolsky from like the early 2000s called The Absolute Minimum Every Software Developer Absolutely Positively Must Know About Unicode and Character Sets, No Excuses. I agree, if you haven't read it, read it. Um, a programmer's Introduction to Unicode was an interesting blog which where that uh, idea of mapping out the Unicode code space came from, UTF-8 everywhere. If you don't believe me when I say you should use it for your interchange systems, read that, it will give you more reasons. Um, Writing Systems and Calligraphy of the World is a fascinating magazine article um, about how different writing systems developed. Um, and you know, it's not to do with software in particular, uh, but it's just really cool stuff. Uh, Dark Corners of Unicode, if you're interested in the weird things like SZs and umlauts and um, ash characters. Uh, and you know, if you're still doing Objective-C code, read the Cocoa documentation from the legacy archive, that's important. If you're interested in the nitty gritty of how Swift does strings under the hood, this forum Swift org post is great and tells you how it's all actually working. PEP393 is sort of the Python equivalent for when they switch to their variable representation internally. And then text rendering hates you and text editing hates you too are two blog posts um, that were sort of doing the rounds about six months ago about the kinds of exciting text problems you have if you have the misfortune of trying to implement a text rendering or editing engine. So that's all I had. Thanks for your attention. And uh, I think we've got a few minutes for questions.